Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, if you're in Hong Kong, welcome to the online international writers workshop. Um, literary uh, uh, international writers workshop literary festival, twenty twenty two at HKBU. Um, my name is Tammy Liming Ho. I teach at the English department here, and uh, I am a committee member of the International Writers' Workshop. I have been a member for a number of years now. Um, so today's, um, this year's literary festival, um, the theme is writing and well-being. And we have uh, six writers in residence. And last night uh, we, um, we met them and uh, they each talked to um, a teaching staff from the uh, faculty. And today we have our first public event and it is entitled, um, When Words Are Not Enough, Poets Using Illustration, Music, Photography and Video. We have two speakers with us and um, I have invited uh, them to um, to choose to select some works written or created by them um, to share with us for um, 20 minutes or so each of them and um, they will uh, there will also be ample of time um, a lot of time for discussion I hope and um, as mentioned, this um, this afternoon's topic is when words are not enough, uh, poets using illustrations, music, uh, photography, and video. Um, I would first like to introduce our two speakers. They might want to say a little bit more about their work and about themselves later on. Um, we have um, Matilda Seuss, West Musen, um, and she is a Danish Swedish artist and writer. Uh, her practice moves between writing, photography, and video. She holds a BFA in fine art photography from HDK Venand Academy of Art and Design, Sweden. And in 2021, she released her first um, book, Unprofessional. Uh, Matilda's work most often revolves around the capitalization of the human body and departs from personal experience as she has worked as a professional model for more than 12 years. An interesting, a, a very fascinating Thing, um, they have learned about um, Matilda's work is uh, she hired three filmmakers um, to each create uh, a film from the same 25 filmed, um, uh, sorry, 25 yes, uh, war, uh, filmed war materials, which document uh, her as a, um, as a model in China for, um, for several years. So I would like to know a little bit more about that later on. And our second speaker is Colin Hurd. Colin um, is a poet and lecturer. Um, she, uh, he has written a, uh, several poetry co uh, collections, including uh, Two OK, published by Blaze Box and Glove, uh, Glove Box published by uh, Knives, Forks and Spoons Press. Um, is a, and, and uh, Glove Box has been um, named a recommended collection in the forward prices. And let me see, I wanted to say a little bit more. Um, Colin also collaborated with um, with a number of um, of other artists and writers, including S. J. Fowler, uh, Sam Small, um, uh, T. Person, uh, Kat Ultram, uh, and Ruthie Kennedy. And um, th 
these collaborations often have an art and visual element, such as co-editing with um, Sam Small, um, a, a, a um, collaboration uh, with Sam Small, uh, all becomes art, a two volume anthology of poems in response to the to the paintings of Joan um, Erdley in 2021. Uh, and um, I would like to perhaps uh, to start, uh, may I invite uh, both of you, um, perhaps Colin first, to just tell us a little bit about your methods of um, collaborations and, um, and the different genres that uh, you are drawn to and the, and, and the selection of, of um, writers and artists that you work with because you, it, it, it's a range of, uh, of writers. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks for that lovely introduction. It's so lovely to be doing this event. Um, it actually has been especially nice uh, because I, when I, um, uh, this is now me sort of opening up the, uh, like uh, looking at the other side of the tapestry for this event. Sorry, I, uh, I tried to keep it professional and on the surface, but I'm now going to show a little bit of the behind the scenes. And um, when we were talking about kind of what we were going to do for this event, um, uh, there was a kind of back and forth email where we were, where, um, uh, the kind of we were having a discussion about what I would talk about and whether this was the perfect event for me to be in and, and whether I'd, I I had kind of used um, kind of uh, mixed media, uh, I guess, uh, in my work uh, to the extent that this would be a kind of appropriate event. And when we were having that conversation, I was thinking mainly of a few collaborations that I'd done with different printmakers, so Kat Utram that you mentioned. But actually then, just in the last couple of days when I was kind of preparing what I was going to do, I realized that I'd completely blanked out and forgotten, and they're not all that long ago, um, things that I'd done uh, that, that I'd done that definitely are mixed, you know, completely are mixed media. And, um, and I hadn't really, I don't know why, I'd kind of, I think you get into habits of thinking in terms of like the book and the publication. And there are lots of kind of different projects that I'd been involved in that, that fit really neatly into this. And I'm, hope, and I'm gonna show uh, when, when it comes to kind of my turn to, to show my work, I'm going to kind of show a range of those. Um, but now to answer your question properly, the, I think the reason why it's easy for, or why I kind of forgot about them is one, just um, kind of my own inadequacy, but also I, um, they, they tend, a lot of these collaborations tend to happen um, kind of unexpectedly. And I don't, I don't often start from the point of view of, uh, oh, I need to make this piece of work or, you know, like in universities, we're constantly told about like kind of impact and research impact and the kind of impact that our work makes and stuff like that. And a lot of these projects are not very, don't really fit very well into that because they tend to be kind of um, peripheral or kind of on the margins of other projects. So quite often it will just be a case of an artist or a writer friend of mine who, um, suggest so you could do this and um, you know help out with this aspect of my project and then I'll kind of write something for that and we'll collaborate in that way and, and one of the projects I'm going to show is definitely that kind and then other times it's the kind of invitation as part of a kind of group exhibition or something like that and um, and I think I've yeah I think I've often not kind of formalized these things into thinking of them kind of as work and um, or, or as kind of my kind of artistic output which I primarily tend to think of in terms of poems and poetry collections but actually like it's really exciting to me based on this event to look back at a lot of other things I've done and kind of start to think of those as part of what I do not from the point of view of you know wanting to formalize it into uh, you know now I'm a visual artist and now these are all my kind of artworks but more just like recognizing that actually we all do work so like um or often people work like in ways that are quite diffuse and not really easily categorizable and stuff. I went just as a, I'm sorry, I know I'm already going on a little bit, but I went to an amazing event recently at the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh, where it was a friend of mine, um, a poet called Jane Goldman, who had been commissioned by the gallery to look at their archives and, and kind of find things in their archives. Um, and, and a number of different writers had done this and they had always, um, maintained that their first woman artist that they exhibited in the fruit market was um, Marina Abramovich. 
and they'd always maintained that their first solo show was a solo show um, uh, by an artist called Bruce Lacey. And, um, but um, my friend Jane had kind of discovered that this art of the solo show by Bruce Lacey was actually really a collaborative exhibition between Bruce Lacey and an artist called Jill Bruce, uh, who he was married to. And um, so basically what they've done is they've kind of rehabilitated Jill Bruce within the gallery and kind of now invited her back to do a performance and things like that to kind of make amends for this. And, um, but she uh, did this beautiful presentation of all the work that she's done over the years. And it included things like kind of picnics as a kind of art performance that she'd done. So sometimes they were like birthday parties for her kid uh, who was called Saffron and it was kind of yellow themed picnic and performance. And I actually just love the idea that art is actually something that we do across all of our lives. And it's not something that is always kind of formalized into really clear cut, this is a work of art and this is the little caption of it and stuff like that. So um, sorry to ramble on a little bit, but that's, that's kind of, yeah, that's what's excited about me about preparing for this event. Thank you very much. Um, there were uh, um, there were a couple of um, audience members who who said they uh, they couldn't hear you very well, Colin. Um, I wonder if your um, what's the setting of your um, of your speaker. Um, I will try. Is that any better? Um, Because it's webinar, I I cannot actually see. Um, I think it was I think it was better. It sounded louder now, at least for me. Mm, mm. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure what that was then. Um, I'll just try and talk really loud as well. <laughs> mm. No, I, I um I could hear you, but yes, it was a a, a bit faint. Um, thank you very much for talking about um this uh, other works that you have done and. And um, and I'm glad that the the discussion um, we have now um, has inspired you to 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 think about other works that you have completed. Um, before we move on to Matilda, um, I actually have a question for for you, Colin. Um, I was looking at your website and and I'm very interested in in the um in your the um how you put your reaction to um no actually how you include reaction to your poetry by others on your website and um it's 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 a um it's a conscious decision why right? is something you, you have decided to do. And I find it to be very cheeky, but also um, uh, quite interesting. So you add these uh, reactions on, on the website and that must mean something to you in, um, in, in perhaps in, in different ways. Now our, our audience members might, might go to your website to, to see what comments I'm talking about. Um, that's, um, thank you so much. Yeah, that's, so for one thing, that's a great prompt for me to, uh, not right now, but, uh, later on very quickly update my website. Um, but, um, but I think, so I, I think I know what you're referring to, which is, so some of it is just pure vanity. I do put up, there's some nice things that people have said about my work, which I, which I have put up there. Um, but there is also, so when I was, uh, when I was in the, um, forward prize anthology, and there was a review of it in the Daily Mail, which isn't the most kind of um, great newspaper. Uh, that's the understatement of the year. Um, and they, uh, there was a review of that anthology in the Daily Mail. And there was a point where it, it was talking about various things. And then it said, and ridiculous poems about rugs. And it didn't name me, but I was the only poem. I was the only poet who had a poem about a rug in the anthology. So then I just kind of took that ridiculous poems and yeah, just put that on my website. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, Matilda, can you, um, uh, as I said earlier, I'm interested in in your work about um, about the firmed. Um, about how you were filmed 
um, in when when you were uh, modeling in China, and how did that come about? I um, I think many um, of our audience members would be interested in that. Yes, thank you so much, Tammy. Um, so this project is um, a film installation that is called Unprofessional, the same title as uh, my book, actually. Um, and maybe, can I share my screen? Because then I can just um, show a picture of the work. Um, I showed this work actually three weeks ago here in Leipzig, where I'm based at the moment. Um, and yeah, it's it's right, as you say, Tammy. So I uh, went both to Hong Kong and to China over a period of three years um, where I was a, a fashion model and modeling contracts. Uh, and I brought this like small video camera uh, because I had an idea that I wanted to make a documentary about uh, yeah about modeling and about the industry and you know like a little behind the scenes kind of um, but when I came home I just it was so so difficult for me to work with this material myself um, I don't know maybe it was too intimate or it was too difficult to hear my own voice and look at my own face so much um, but uh, my solution was uh, to hire three different filmmakers, one documentary filmmaker, one uh, musician and artist who did a music video. And uh, the third one was a Chinese uh, fashion photographer uh, that I met in China who I worked with. And so I hired these three people to do three different films for me. Um, and then I uh, built this little cabin that you see on the pictures here. Um, which is sort of uh, my take on a changing room cabin, you know, that you have in, in fashion stores where you go to change. Um, and I put these contracts that I made with the filmmakers and the outside. And then you can go inside of the cabin and sit on this little stool uh, and sort of have your privacy um, while you're watching these films. And the films are around five minutes each. So they are not so long. Um, but yeah, they are very different, uh, all the films. One is like a mini documentary, then there is a music video, and then there is some sort of pseudo uh, weird documentary also. Um, yeah, and but also what was really interesting to me was that sometimes um, they used the same film material and I thought that was just amazing that they, because they looked at 25 hours of material and then they chose the same things. Um, and that's, yeah, that was so funny to me. Um, yeah, and the method, I guess, was sort of uh, conceptualizing a little bit how, um, how you have something that is very intimate, that was this filmed material that you kind of just gave to someone else and you gave up the control over um, your sort of your own material. And that was, yeah, that was sort of my idea with it. Um, but then again, I also, you know, had some power in choosing the, choosing the filmmakers. So for me, this work is like this constant, like power struggle between, uh, you know, selling yourself, selling your work, but also somehow you know, uh, trying to have some kind of control. Yeah, so I guess it was like a play with control for me, this piece. Thank you. It's, it's, it's interesting that um, you said about, um, what you said about choosing the three filmmakers in China. Um, how was the selection process? Um, did they audition for you? And, um, and, no. <laughs> and that is also interesting um, in, on another level, um, when you talked about the, um, the, the, the level of control 
and that's something that's very um that's especially for a um for a female uh, model i remember you mentioned you talked about that yesterday last night um so how um how did that happen with the with the uh, three filmmakers yeah so uh, i think that was kind of the vaguest or most difficult part of the project was how to uh, choose these people ideally i would have liked to you know hire 20 people that did like uh, extremely different things with the material but i just didn't have the money and i wanted to be able to pay these filmmakers for that time uh, so i i sort of had to choose and um, so I chose um, the documentary filmmaker because she used to be my teacher in Denmark. She's a Danish uh, woman who makes documentaries um, and she was sort of my idol. So I thought it would be amazing to, you know, to have someone that I admired so much look at my work and uh, or look at the, my um, my film material and see what could happen with that. Um, and then I wanted also to, um, to have someone uh, who was in China and who was actually there when I filmed the material. So it was important for me to, uh, yeah, to collaborate with someone who, um, who actually also was on some of the film because I filmed on his shoot. So I was very happy when he said yes to do it also, uh, this fashion photographer from Guangzhou um, called Feng Lili. And uh, the last one um, was just an artist I had seen on Instagram that I thought made really cool and really weird stuff. And I was sure that he could like, that he would not be shy to like fuck the material up somehow and like make something really weird. Uh, so that was like my reason for choosing him. Um, yeah, mm. but yeah, I would, you know, I would love to expand on this project and I would love to hire 15 more people to like, see how different results you can get from the same material. Mm. If I yeah. heard you correctly, you said that the three filmmakers, um, they happened to choose the same material from the raw material that you... Yeah, uh, some places, yeah. Can you say, can, can you Tell us a little bit more about that. What kind of material um, or, or content did they, um, mm -hmm. did, uh, like, uh, um, that they were so interested in? Yeah, so it's just these small moments. There is like uh, one time where I'm sitting in a plane and filming, um, you know, the film that you always see in a plane. I was watching some like Hollywood movie, and then there's a house that explodes in the in the filmed material and the two of them chose uh, this image. So I guess that was for like the visual effect of it. Uh, and then uh, two of them also showed a clip where I, um, I take off my sneakers and I put on high heels. And I think like, I think that that was just such a strong symbol for going from private Matilda to professional Matilda, like taking on my high heels and, you know, going in for a casting as a model. Mm. So that's my guess, at least to why they chose that. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Um, now I would like to um, invite Colin to, um, to read us your work or to show us um, some of your collaborations if you um, if you would like sure. your, uh, installation sure um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm just hoping that you can hear me okay and you're getting quite a close in view which is just me trying to make sure that I'm uh, heard but um, I'm gonna share my screen um, okay uh, I'll just go into um, okay, so uh, as I was saying, this um, uh, yeah, this was kind of quite exciting to me to um, remember some of these projects. I'm also just checking the time to make sure I don't go too far. Um, uh, and um, 
So this first one, this was in, uh, which is actually probably one of the more recent ones. This was in 2019 and it was shown in the Edinburgh Art Festival. And this is an exhibition primarily by an artist called Corinne Sworn, um, C-O-R-I-N-S-W-O-R-N. And uh, the exhibition was called Habits of Assembly. And basically, I'll show you another kind of view of it. Basically, she put in this um, steel structure, uh, this kind of cage, and then there was a video installation, uh, which you can see there, of um, two dancers. And the dance was developed um, in collaboration with those dancers. And it was um, based on um, kind of, um, the idea of it was the kind of movements that we make sort of involuntarily to do with kind of signals from our environment. So like, uh, things that thing like movements that we make without necessarily realizing them that we get encouraged to make by the buildings we're in and, and the kind of like stim stimuli that we that we that we have around us so whether that's you know like this is a kind of my kind of more kind of obvious example that probably is far too obvious and not sophisticated enough in terms of like what what they actually did but like things like you know where you kind of duck your head because you're going through a door and and, and stuff like that and um uh so that was the dance and then the there was also a sound piece which was playing within this space and i tried to find a natural recording of the sound piece as it was um actually uh kind of um played which i couldn't find um but i have the text of it which which i can read um so uh, basically what corin asked me to do was to write a uh, um a poem that was kind of a to-do list. So like based on, yeah, just kind of like pressures and, and kind of like things that we do in our everyday lives and, and kind of, yeah, just like the kind of constant kind of struggle and pressure to get through all the things that are on our um, to-do list. Um, so if you just bear with me a second, I have, I'll get this text up. Uh, and then when we, um, when we actually, uh, so we, we recorded it and we sort of overlayered, she'd also written something and we kind of laid over uh, my one and her one and they played as a, as a uh, sound um, installation in a way within this cage. Um, so uh, I'll just read some of my text. So your task today is to move anywhere, not to grow. Sorry, children, sorry, bodybuilders, usually my two main audiences. This is something we all do together. It is we make PVC glue slippers with rosemary spikes stuck all over them. Too much on my plate. We do this to take the pressure off and to walk from place to place smelling ourselves. Your task is to remember where you parked and drive me home. A present, an essay. I want to be one of those people who gets what they want. So slammed every time I breathe, I blow my feet off. I want to be one of those people whose desires weigh less than them. Let's say I took on your tasks. Hi, artists, art fans, filmmakers, poets, etc. I want to know what you want me to do. I want to be one of those people who makes time to tell all their friends and family regularly that they're goodish people. Hi, artists, art fans, etc. You're good at art and liking art. I want to be one of those people that doesn't get stressed and riddled with envy. I'm going to take on your tasks. Going to to do what you have to do and you can take on my tasks and I'll do what you have to do. I'll try my hand at cooking for someone who doesn't just want to eat couscous and chili sauce for the rest of their life. I want to be comfortable if I'm in the middle seat. Is there anything I can help with? Anything I can do to help? I'm putting in a funding application for a center for pleasure and I wanted to invite you to contribute. I'm holding a conference on licking your own shoulder, kissing your own knees, eating from a dog bowl on the floor, making an out of office that's really camp. Hi artists, art fans, your shirts are delicious. You all seem like you've got things under control, but good tote bags, busy as beavers, snowed under. And look at me practically in an easy jet uniform, practically asking myself to, is there anything I can help with? Swamped in errands, swimming in this and that. Is there anything I can do that would lighten the load? Your task today, I mean, you do it so beautifully. Your task today, the big thing you need to achieve before you sleep tonight is to shuck off your next appointment, is to tell your children to pick themselves up from school, is to tell your boss to tie their own shoelaces for a change, is to beg at your dog until it opens a tin, is to ask your students to give you feedback, is to wait until a banana starts to peel you, is to sit and piss yourself until your elderly relatives wash you up, is to lie on the floor until someone gets a hoover to suck you up, is to be crumpled in a basket until someone can be bothered to iron you, is to be overgrown until someone mows you. Um, so that was, yeah, Habits of Assembly uh, with Corin Sworn. <clears throat> 
Um, so this is probably the kind of grandest and most professional looking thing I'm going to show you because the rest are kind of my work, whereas this is the brilliant work of um, Corin Swarn. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please, Colin. Um, this is uh, this is a thing that I did um, uh, in 2011, I think, and uh, this was part of a mini festival that was called "I Am Not a Poet," and um, it basically just gave a whole. It was in a place called the Forest Cafe, which was a kind of alternative art space and vegan cafe, um, and um, they asked. Uh, people to take uh, like different poets to take a room and just basically you could just do whatever you wanted with the room so um what i did is um th they used to there used to be when i was growing up uh, there were these in fact they still make them i think but these um cds and, and kind of albums um called now that's what i call music and then there was a number. So one that I had when I was young and listened to all the time was now that's what I call music 26. And so what I decided to do in this space was have these big rolls of paper all over the walls and then um, write out all the lyrics. So like I had a Walkman, a Discman and kind of had the um, headphones in and went up this ladder and wrote in these colored pens, all the lyrics as I like just basically playing the songs and trying to keep up with the lyrics and just write out but obviously I didn't manage to keep up with the lyrics so they they kind of all melded into one and then I would just go back to the beginning and then kind of do it again um and so I uh, I just wrote as 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 kind of much as I could off the lyrics of that song so this text that kind of grew around the gallery I was there for a week became yeah just like a whole cycle through different kind of pop songs from that album now that's what I call music 26 um, but as you can probably see, some people, quite to my uh, irritation, didn't understand that this was the idea. So when I would like take a break, or actually even sometimes when I was doing it, people would come in, grab a pen and just start drawing things on the walls. Um, but I just kind of allowed it to happen. I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, internally I chastised them, but I didn't uh, vocalize that. Um, and, um, and then we had readings and things in, in the space as well. Um, so these are just a few other kind of uh, shots, but I tried to find some better ones, but um, this is, yeah, so that's the CD, the double double album. Now that's what I call Music 26. Um, and I mean, some, I mean, this kind of weird um, dragon or when it's not a dragon, but like creature uh, with the drum is, is obviously a kind of nicer thing than I was doing anyway. So um, uh, yeah, so that was, that was one thing. I don't have any of that text. Um, I don't think it's kind of legible on these images. And anyway, I'm not sure whether it, it really would be that good to, to read any of that, but um, but this is just to kind of showcase that uh, a thing I did. Um, okay, this is, uh, so this was in 2016. Colin, do you yeah. regret not having the text or um, was the, uh, were the images sufficient for you? So that's the the idea, and and that's it. And yeah, yeah. For me, the kind of event, the the sort of event was sufficient, and then the images. Um, that's a really good point, actually. Uh, and it actually In does high really resolution images. Next time. Yeah. No. Next time, I probably should. That, that you're right. Um. Uh. You're totally right. Um. And it would be nice to be able to read some of this. I mean, maybe also if I found them on my phone, they probably would be slightly more uh, legible than, than these are. Um, but for me, it kind of was so as well as, so like uh, some of these images you can like, so where there's people reading and things, they were, um, the idea was that it wasn't just like, so yeah, there was, I was doing this and I was interested in what people would do when they came in and, and read things in a space. But I also, uh, sorry, so read some of the text in, in the space, but I also sort of wanted it to be, so I held a few different kind of readings um, in the space and I just kind of wanted it to be, um, yeah, I don't know, just just to kind of think about like what would happen if, if, I, um, if I did this, which was like a kind of open, like was meant to be like a kind of, yeah, kind of opening up of like, a, like using this almost to like take me back into this, album that I'd listened to so much when I was young so it was like a kind of 
like, yeah, I don't know, opening up like a kind of nostalgic space. I mean, they're all just really like, you know, like pop, like just familiar kind of bubblegum kind of pop songs. But it, um, but I wanted to kind of, yeah, just kind of create this sort of nostalgic kind of pop space. Um, uh, I mean, that is very much, I can't believe I'm about to tell you this, um, but I, like when I was young, like I had a, I had a kind of shrine in my bedroom for the Spice Girls, <laughs> like a cupboard where like, it was like a double cupboard and it was just full of like all the stuff that like, you know, Pepsi cans with the Spice Girls on it. I was also a member of the fan club, so I did get stuff sent to me. And like, like it was just full of this stuff. And I felt like this was a kind of version of that. I don't, I don't have that. I wish I had, I wish I'd kept that Spice Girls shrine because I feel like I would just exhibit that for the rest of my life. Maybe I should recreate it. But this, um, this felt like I was kind of doing that. I was like building that kind of like space of like what that cupboard would be and then inviting people into it. And I think the reason I say it like that is when I was young, the, that kind of, like that Spice Girls shrine was definitely a kind of private thing. Like I didn't, I didn't show my friends this Spice Girls shrine um, for maybe obvious reasons. And the, um, so like, it felt like this was maybe me creating this space, which then I could invite kind of friends and poets and, and artists kind of into to, to do stuff within it. Um, so uh, yeah, and so I think the event in this, the kind of event was, was the main thing. Um, I'm going to go ahead to another kind of strange. So this is actually interesting in terms of what I was saying there about kind of openness and kind of acknowledging and, and kind of openness and, and um, inviting people in. And then the kind of inverse of that, I guess, is, is kind of privacy and uh, kind of closed off and, and secrets and things. And this was a project that I did for, it was a, um, in Edinburgh, there's a, big um, building which is called Summer Hall and it used to be the um, vet school, uh, the university vet school and it was sold off and it um, it became and is still a kind of art centre and they just have all these kind of strange spaces within it like the dissection room and, and different kind of lecture theatres and that sort of thing and um, so they, uh, they, they uh, for Halloween this writer called Ryan Van Winkle curated a kind of series and gave again kind of gave writers different rooms and so this was a thing I made for this where I watched and um, there's a kind of horror well he made all sorts of different films but he's, he's kind of had made a few really exciting kind of horror films called a filmmaker called um, Curtis Harrington and I watched his films and wrote with invisible ink on these um, black cards and just kind of again sort of wrote through his films so just kind of watched the films and just wrote whatever kind of like some bits of dialogue stuff that came into my head descriptions of what was on the screen and stuff and just wrote on these cards straight away in invisible ink on them and then I did this kind of installation with these cards with UV light which showed up the ink and then with a kind of ticker and I'll just show you a couple of the ticker views hopefully. Uh, so that's one. The privacy of others is not for you to see. And that's another one. Um, I always keep my word. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of other shots of uh, this so there was like there was also kind of some text again this was in kind of uh, the, the, so the the kind of poster ones they 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 weren't invisible ink exactly they just showed up they kind of sh shone more in, in in uv um and then there was the ticker and then all these kind of black squares you can see around they're all the texts but the text only shows up under and the people had like there were kind of uv torches that people could go around and read with the torches uh the the texts um uh so uh yeah that's that's the kind of end of of the things that i'd really prepared to to show you um uh but maybe uh, yeah is that my that's pretty is that my time pretty much gone um because otherwise i could there's quickly still time. there's still time there's still time okay so maybe i'll just um uh okay i'll very quickly uh just i'll stop share for a second and then share something else um, because uh, the, another thing that I started thinking about in terms of um, 
uh, kind of when words are not enough. And I started thinking, so I love this title, When Words Are Not Enough. Um, but I also started thinking about like it from the other kind of point of view in a way, which is less like when words are not enough, but more like thinking about all the things a word can do. So like, and thinking about all the, um, like uh, just all the, um, occurrences of, of just just kind of how we live in um uh, yeah just constantly surrounded by language and language is kind of constantly working on us and we're kind of constantly negotiating language and, and things like that and um so one aspect of that that really interests me and is kind of important uh to me is um performance i guess and i've done a couple of things um a few kind of events that are um, what uh, what I think of as as um, or what gets kind of talked about as poets theatre, which is um, uh, theatre performances, so plays written by poets, but with non professional actors, usually scripts on stage, um, with usually some degree of kind of um, the 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 playwright, the kind of like poet playwright is acting in other people's plays. So usually you get kind of nights where there's a few different um, poets theater plays productions. Um, and uh, it's a kind of community event, I guess, in the sense that um, you all kind of act in each other's plays, you've got scripts on stage and, and stuff like that. And I've done a few different um, uh, kind of poets theater events, which I've usually organized and then um, quite often kind of uh, yeah, written, written a play um, uh, and then acted in, in other people's plays as well. And one of those, um, uh, which I've done a few different ones with a, with a poet called Ian Morrison. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share an image of, of, of one of those. Um, uh, so this was where we, yeah, we were on exercise bikes. Um, we, were, we were kind of like, kind of meant to be sort of Scottish, like kind of gatekeepers of sort of Scottish literature. And we were on exercise bikes and just kind of having a kind of debate about what was kind of Scottish literature. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, so that, that, was, that was one performance. Um, and uh, I think I'm gonna need a couple of minutes to find, or I, let me, I, I'll try and talk about it as I, as I, um, as I try to find it here. Um, uh, but the, or I think I might have to, you might have to wait and I'll just like have this as a finale right at the end. Um, but I also did uh, a perform a, a kind of um, a poet's theater where I was um, a mermaid with a, or a merman with a um, bubble gun uh, on stage. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, uh, that's about what, what else do I have to say about that? I think performance for me is really interesting because um, I, I would love to, um, so like I love all kinds of poetry readings. I love all, all the kind of gestures, the kind of familiar gestures of the poetry reading. So like where you get the poet sort of saying, oh, which I just did, I can't believe it, but um, where you do that thing of, oh, do I have more time? Or like, do I have time for one more? And that sort of thing, like, all those kind of uh, gestures like, that you see in poetry readings, which are so easy to kind of parody. I kind of love all of that. Like I, 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 I've got a lot of time and space in my life for, for poetry readings. But I also think when you see a uh, kind of really amazing um, uh, and kind of surprising kind of uh, performance approach to, to poetry reading. Uh, it can be, yeah, just just really thrilling and kind of um, uh, like un unexpected. Um, I'm gonna have to show you this on my phone. I'm sorry, it's not very professional of me, but this was the merman bubble gun with then people behind me playing badminton. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay, I think that's probably enough from me just now, is it? Okay, so maybe later on, if you are able to find um, uh, a, a clip, you can show us. Um, a Baptist uh, faculty of arts um, has, a, um, has a very strong theater element, actually. We have, um, um, we have minor in theater studies. Um, so I think um, maybe some of our students would be very interested in, in having a look at um, this, Idea, the, the idea of having um, having um, poetic uh, theatrical events and the the collaborations that you have been talking about. Thank you. 
Um, Matilda, can you uh, share with us your work? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Colin. That was just uh, really amazing to see how you also work visually and performative with text. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, so I thought uh, I just wanted firstly to share a bit from um, from my book that you, Tammy, also mentioned. It's called Unprofessional, uh, and it was um, published last year. I have it also here just to show the size. So it's you know, it's not a typical size for um, um, for a novel or for maybe also a poetry collection, um, because it's really um, it's this uh, yeah, it's a picture book with texts. Maybe I would say it like that. Um, and just to show you also that. Uh, the fund in the book is sort of uh, very big. And um, I chose the size because it reminded me of the books my mom used to read for me when I was a kid. Uh, these picture books that uh, are big and colorful and yeah, has also big text uh, in them. And that was sort of my whole reference to, uh, to how to work with text and image together. Um, so the book is a big mix of uh, self-portraits and there is a lot of food pictures also like this one and a lot of still lights. There's a picture from uh, flying to China, I think. Um, yeah, and so my background is in, in visual studies in photography primarily. Uh, so for me, I also thought it was a great uh, title for this seminar when um, when words are not enough. I think for me, it's almost like the other way around when pictures are not enough, uh, because words came to me um, sort of later uh, in my practice. Um, I had uh, I had this um, we had the opportunity to take a seminar on creative writing when I was studying photography and I did that and it was uh, yeah I can't even explain like how much it opened up for me um, and I felt like I had sort of come come home in a sense um, because uh, I I used to write a lot when I was a kid and my mom is a journalist and I read a lot, so I kind of came from text, but I just had a very long pause of like 15 years in between where I didn't even consider text could be, uh, could be of like, yeah, could be included in my practice. Um, but then I had this course and I started writing um, and it, it sort of became another uh, layer to this project that I was already doing, which was the book. Um, yeah, and I also photographed uh, my fellow models quite a lot, the models that I lived with in these um, model apartments. And I have also a mermaid picture here, <laughs> uh, which was this wonderful shoot uh, in Guangzhou where this was my outfit. Yeah. Um, but I also want to uh, read a little bit for you. I just want to put it on the screen. So I'm going to read um, poems from this book. And the first one is called H Poem. And it's also printed um, both in Danish, which is my native language and the language that I usually write in. Uh, so it's printed in Danish and in English all throughout the book. H poem. At age 12, I tell my mom I hate museums. At age 21, I become very interested in photography. At age 22, I become very interested in cooking and cocaine. At age 27, I become very interested in sex. At age 28, I suddenly develop an interest in poetry. 
follow your heart. Yeah, so this was, I guess, a little bit about how, uh, yeah, how I started also to, to write. Matilda, Matilda, you said that this is um, um, the text is um, in both English and Danish, so it's yeah. uh, bilingual. And um, and did you translate the text? Yeah, so I I do the first translation of the text, and then after that, I have um, I have like a proofreading of it. I had like I don't know three or four proofreadings of this text. But yeah, I initially I did translate the text myself. Um, I think it could be amazing in the future to try to work with some translators also. But I we also talked about that on one of the meetings that when I when I write, it is very like some of it is English, some of it is Danish, some of it is even Swedish because I also lived there for four years. So it is um it is always a mix and my modeling career is almost always in English because I don't really work in Denmark. So yeah, that whole professional life is in English. Yeah. I remember reading your poems for the first time and thinking that they are, um, they have a, an absurdist um, kind of uh, leaning. Yeah. The case. And yeah. And I actually think Collins' poetry as well, um, but in a more deliberately uh, low-key, mundane way. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about it. Uh, I, I didn't mean to yeah, no. Collins. No, no, yeah. Um, so for uh, for the poems when I, um, uh, Matilda, when, when I first uh, read them they, they were just so interesting with the um with with these settings thank you so much i also uh yeah i was a very big fan of colin's work also when i heard it the first time and i feel very inspired by uh sort of the um, um, how do you say uh oh, i'm looking for a word uh, like the the casual way of approaching uh, the audience was extremely um, interesting to me and inspiring. Yeah. Should I continue to? Yes. Sorry. I no. 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 Please. <laughs> okay. So the next one is called uh, "Fuck Me, I'm Famous." As I board the plane, it smells like mushrooms. It smells like my annual mushroom hunts in the Swedish and Danish forests. Pochini, stinkhorn, and spicy chanterelle. The old lady queuing in front of me is wearing a t-shirt bearing the words, fuck me, I'm famous. There's something sick about flying in the dark. The smog settles like a Photoshop layer over the city as we ascend, pulling contrast out of the landscape. We fly by the moon that isn't full, but wild and orange, like the illuminated roads below us. We're alone in the dark now, the moon and I. It calms me. We have a bond, the two of us. No one fucks with us. But suddenly it disappears behind a cloud and I start to wonder, is the Chinese moon the same as the Danish moon? Is it watching over me? Above the moon is a star, the North Star, but it blinks, I see, it's just a plane. When we land somewhere in China, the moon is cold and white. I get off the plane and it smells like peanuts and jungle. The oil of sweet almonds. I grease my nipples with the oil of sweet almonds because pink silicone nip, sorry, because pink silicone nipple stickers have turned them into dry little blackberry butts. I hide my tampon string between my butt cheeks because I wear a thong when I'm menstruating. I dream of warm nights with money and riesling on top of Chinese hotels, and I dream of being choked by large biceps on soft sheets. The distance between the brain and the heart is about 20 centimeters and the snake changes its skin four times in a year. Suggers. I remember once super clearly, I was lying on my bed in what Google had told me was Tokyo's most haunted hotel on the last evening. I had been away for three months and I had finally received my salary in cash because that's how we roll. And I laid it out 
and I laid it all out on my bed and I laid down on top of it all and sobbed unhappily. Then I took my camera and shot some self portraits and I thought, this is going to change my career. I'm so fucking real. Money doesn't make you happy, suckers. And later when I got the film back, I laughed so hard that I peed my pants a little. There I lay looking like Gollum on top of a large pile of damp banknotes. The sticker. Excuse me, says a young Chinese man and puts a sticker on my forehead. I want to mark you. You want to what? I ask and look up. I want to mark you. You have different makeup, he says, and moves on to the next head. Um, how much time do I have? Do I have time to read two more? Yes, okay. The girl with calf eyes. The young girl who arrived yesterday in the middle of the night is sitting next to me in the casting car. I ask her where she's from, but for refrain from asking any follow-up questions. I can't help you because I don't want to. She sits stiffly by my side, looking out into the fog with her calf eyes. From behind the windows of the air-conditioned minibus, I see a large raptor sitting at the very top of a flat roof of a high-rise. Its enormous brown wings are tucked closely into its body. I'm wondering if she is thinking too that there are almost no birds in China. Slowly it spreads its wings. She's just 15. Has she noticed it? The bird's enormous wingspan spreads as it plunges down along the building's nasty tiles in a free fall. But I don't ask her. I can't help you because I don't want to. You'll learn it, calf eyes. Arnold Schwarzenegger. That day, when rice with chicken, celery, and cashews became my new favorite dish, we had sex on the 27th floor of a high rise in Hong Kong with your family's maid in the room next door. She was also the one who cooked for us. I was ashamed. Above the headboard hung a quote by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I no longer remember the words, but I do remember being ashamed of cheating on my boyfriend with someone who had a quote by Arnold Schwarzenegger hanging over his bed. It was bad, but I enjoyed the attention and your company. On the balcony, we smoked cigarettes because your parents were not home. And we looked down upon the empty pool, which you had promised me I could swim in, and which was also the reason I had come to visit you in the first place. When I arrive in a new city, I like to see it from above, to figure, out, to figure something out, or maybe just to be overwhelmed. Yeah, that was the text I had prepared. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Colin, do you have um, your clip or clips ready? Uh, no, I don't. Sorry, I don't. Um, I don't have a clip. It was actually just that picture I was I was looking for. Um, so no, unfortunately, I don't have I don't have a clip. But I just wanted to say that was so beautiful. I loved seeing um, the, the poems and, and and hearing and hearing Matilda read them. Um, uh, and it's interesting because like the like you know the, the session is called like uh, when words are not enough and it's obviously to do with yeah where the visual the kind of intersections of the visual and the sound and things like that in language but actually when you just see and hear the poems being read like that they are so visual and kind of saturated with such a strong sense of like of the moments that they're describing and also um but they do that in such a way that it, it also feels like yeah like even though Sometimes I feel like text where there's like where emotion or kind of like sig like sig signatures or signals of emotion when it's kind of stripped out and the text is quite minimalist, it almost makes the emotion even more resonant and kind of like and, and like you kind of feel the emotion even more when it's kind of stripped out of the of, of the text and it's just to do with it just kind of the, the visual and the, and the sound and everything and that, that it almost makes the emotion more kind of there on the surface and available so yeah I absolutely love that that reading from from Matilda. Thank you so much Colin. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so uh, we will be opening up uh, for questions. Um, so if you have questions for Colin and um, Matilda, please uh, do leave those um, your questions um, in the Q&A box. 
And um, perhaps I'll start with a few questions. Okay. Um, so Colin, um, Matita, um, both of you published um, new works in 2021. Um, Colin co-edited All Becomes Art and Matilda, um, you published uh, Unprofessional. And of course, uh, some of these might be several years in the making. So it, 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 um, these books may not necessarily be um, published or uh, prepared for publication specifically for uh, 2021, but I want to know what has the year 2021 meant to you and your work and your creative process. So we know we, we, we're we now going through um, COVID. And um, so it is perhaps to start with, um, we'll start with talking about your books, um, your works, that were um, published in 2021. And you can also say more about um, your um, creations during this time um, from uh, between 2020 to 2022. Yeah, so uh, I can start. Um with saying that uh, I was living in Sweden while creating this book, which kind of became uh, known worldwide for notoriously just, um, uh, you know, not really doing anything about the COVID uh, crisis. So um, Sweden was actually pretty much open throughout uh, all of COVID, um, which uh, it was weird for me to see, I think how much my friends abroad were suffering and how difficult and different their lives were when my life was just the same because nothing really changed in Sweden. They never closed down. They never forced people to wear masks. They never reinforced any of these um, things that we had uh, other places. So for me, it was lonely in the sense that I couldn't travel to see my friends but it was also, uh, I think, very privileged to be in Sweden at that uh, point and creating there. Um, but um, it was the year after I finished my BA that I did this book. And um, yeah, it was a very lonely process and I didn't have, uh, I didn't have that many close friends in Sweden, uh, which was also good in the sense that I just basically worked for half a year did nothing just woke up worked on the book uh, and then went to sleep and did nothing else and maybe in a sense that was also how many other people had it during those COVID times uh, of being like yes yeah but Colin maybe you can speak a little bit to how it was where you where you were Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel like I did absolutely nothing other than my job during COVID. And I, I, that's how I feel. But but actually looking back, like it's and now, like, yeah, there are these things that are coming out that are that kind of do do kind of evidence something to the contrary. So, um, um, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is I so I had a book out which came out in December 2019. And so I kind of, I didn't really, I hadn't really kind of promoted it or really done anything for it. So it's called You Name It. Um, and that came out in December, 2019. And then I, um, uh, and then like, you know, COVID, you know, like hit, when it kind of started to hit in March, 2020, I still sort of felt like this was brand new and I was still kind of planning things to do for it. And, um, and I never got uh, managed to, to kind of to kind of do that. Um, so I, I feel like in some ways, and I, I, there are so many people that are in kind of worse situations as well, in, in, in all sorts of ways, but in terms of like having books that came out uh, kind of around or during COVID, um, in, you know, like I think it was very difficult for, for people. Um, so yeah, that was just one thing to say about that. But then 
um, yeah, I did. I have in, in the end kind of edited a few different anthologies in the COVID period. So one which was um, kind of scheduled to come out um, and kind of, uh, we'd kind of planned it a little bit b before COVID uh, was this anthology, uh, Glasgow uh, Anthology, which is, and it, this is quite a thick book actually. Um, uh, uh, so I'm just going to show it off even more. Um, uh, the um, And this basically, so uh, it's, uh, a publisher called Dostoevsky Wannabe, who um, publish, uh, they do these city anthologies. So they've done some kind of all over the world, different cities where they get an editor who's based in that city to just kind of curate a kind of sampler of, of writing within that city. And when we were invited to do it, um, uh, I got together, so um, Ruthie Kennedy and Tommy Pearson, um, who I collaborated with on editing this, they're both kind of um, former students of mine. And they, um, we, uh, we were told that we could only have 12 writers included, like that was the maximum for the, um, for the anthology. And we thought there's just no way we could do this with 12 writers. So what we did, first of all, is we kind of bargained and we said, well, can we have, if we make it collaborative, so we, that we have a rule that every submission has to be collaborative, then we can at least have 24 writers involved. Um, but it ended up being, we went way over, even within that, we went way over. So I think there's like, 46 writers involved in this anthology um, uh, in it and um, uh, yeah there's just some really exciting kind of work again like a lot of kind of hybrid work using images and, and, and text and things um, but a lot of these collaborations because of Covid they ended up happening uh, either kind of um, you know online that the, the writers would collaborate with each other online or they would do it um, you know, like they kind of like there's people spoken about, they would meet up in parks and talk about their collaboration. And it became like a kind of kind of one of the things that they were able to go out and do. Um, uh, so that was kind of really interesting, kind of exciting to see. And it's taken a long time to come out, but but eventually it has. Um, and then, yeah, you mentioned the All Becomes Art anthology as well, um, which again is just like, it's a kind of incredible, um, to me that like, so we've ended up, this is just part one and there's a, this is quite a small book. I don't know why I'm obsessed with the size of books today, but um, this is a small book, but it's, uh, but there's two volumes of it. So um, one is out, All Becomes Art part one and All Becomes Art part two is just about to come out. And they, um, but the reason I kind of do, do comment on that and, and it like, um, is that this is a Scottish artist called Joan Ardley, who is quite well known, like very well known. Um, and she's definitely acknowledged as one of the kind of like a kind of really important modern Scottish artist, but for years she has been kind of neglected. Um, and um, it's the uh, last year was the centenary of her birth. And so we thought we would put out this call and, and ask writers to respond to one of her paintings or drawings or, or kind of one aspect of her work. And we got, you know, um, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of submissions. And then uh, there's a kind of selection of them in the, in the two anthologies. So I just find that quite inspiring that people did want to kind of you know that there were so many people interested in, in responding to the work and my approach to editing this is now veering off a little bit but my approach to editing is definitely there was a curator in new york in i don't know in washington dc um uh his name slightly goes out of my head but i'll find i'll, I'll, I'll kind of try and uh, get it but um who basically would do these so he was a curator of a big museum in washington dc but he a couple of times did this thing which he um where he just basically said that he would hang any work that if anybody could get there within a window bring their work um he would he would hang it and that was his kind of policy and he, he obviously they did other main curated exhibitions but he had this kind of open policy where if you could get there and bring work you it would be it would be hung for like a 48 hour period and i just love that kind of openness and that kind of like just creating a space where people will just kind of bring the work. And of course, we did have to reject some submissions to these anthologies, but I like the fact that they kind of have that, the kind of feeling of being just kind of open houses for everybody to come in. And especially in COVID, now to come back to the question, those kinds of spaces didn't exist in real life. So it's interesting to kind of make them more in print and, and online and things. So the um, um, Dostoevsky wannabe um, press, which published, uh, you name it, is it, uh, um, and and you said they they published one um, in 
in uh, based in different cities and that each each of these um, focus or features uh, 12 writers uh, what are the other places that they um, they focus so, on um there's a range I find it very um, interesting is there's something similar with um I don't remember the name of the press now, but they, but they do something similar, uh, but longer. Not like yours. They, they, they their, their books are, are, are longer, and um, so there's Shanghai, and um, if I remember, there's um, somewhere in India and. So um, for Dostoevsky wannabe, they um. So, I mean, obviously they are based in the UK, so there is quite a kind of UK focus, but so we're the most recent one, Glasgow, and then there's Birmingham, Amsterdam in Holland, Boston in the States, Sheffield in the UK, Paris, Dundee wow. in Scotland, Nottingham, Santiago, Manchester, Norwich, and Bristol. Um, so those are the ones that they've done so far. I think it just depends on who who's editing, who, who you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, who decides to edit one really. That's very interesting. Um, may I remind our um, audience members that you are very, very welcome. Um, and in fact, very encouraged to leave any uh, comments or questions or feedback that you may have uh, for our two speakers today. I'll ask one more question before we um, go to the questions left by um, uh, audience members. So um, this might be a little bit hard question. What do you think makes your um, creations, your poetry, your work, your um, uh, your projects stand out? I know as writers, as um, artists, as creators, we don't like talking too much or uh, about our work or evaluate our work um, but I think it is helpful for readers and others to know um, what you think what we think about um, our process of uh, of creation so is it um, for you is it because of um, do you think working with different genres and having the opportunities to do so, and having the, the abilities to do so. Um, does this ability make you stand out as, um, as, a, um, as an artist, as a writer? Um. Mm, I think, like you say, Tammy, that's very hard to like evaluate like yourself like this. But um, what I can say is that uh, it's uh, it's opening some possibilities. As for example, I have been before in a lot of visual arts, um, you know, communities, and uh, had. Um, yeah, that has sort of been where I have, you know, showed my things. And this is the first time that I am able to show my things in a literary context. So for me, that is super, uh, that's super important for me. And that's just so nice. Uh, and yeah, you know, I never dreamed of this. So that, yeah, I can say that it's opening doors for me uh, also since I started to work with writing. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking a bit about this um, and partly it was triggered by one of the questions, the really interesting questions in the Q&A yesterday, um, which was uh, somebody had asked, um, like, how do you know if a poem is good? And, um, uh, or, you know, the question was something along those lines. And, um, and, it, and I, yeah, I'm not really, um, 
like I, I'm not really that interested whether a, whether a text or a poem is good or not. Like I don't know how I would make a judgment about that particularly. Like obviously I can talk about whether I like um, a kind of text and, and I can talk about what, like, you know, there are texts that I've written that I like better than texts that I, that I that other texts that I've written. Um, but like that kind of question of like whether work is good or bad, I don't think is that interesting. And I think like one of the things because you know it will always be the the like it's always a value judgment that is based on kind of um uh yeah the values of us of a society and and a, and a kind of community and um you know work that seems seems good can can you can kind of change your opinion about it and, and things like that so um the and i actually think that yeah that it's kind of important that we do tune into that kind of question of like good and bad but actually it can be more interesting to look at it from the kind of like bad point of view so to think about aesthetics that are that are generally seen as kind of bad so like um imagery that is cliched or um uh, phrasing that is like overly subjective um, and actually think about what those values of kind of like this is what bad writing is what does that actually, like tuning into that and almost like taking that as your aesthetic what does that actually say about um what kind of work we are excluding what kind of work what kind of like values and things are we are we kind of um uh like um you know writing off as, as kind of tacky or bad and what does that say about our kind of um, in like kind of class structures and, 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 and the kind of values that we hold as a society. And I think one of the reasons why I'm quite attracted to doing work in media that I'm not trained in is because I'm, and I'm actually not trained in writing really either. Like I haven't done, like I teach on a creative writing course, but I haven't done any kind of creative writing, formal creative writing course myself. Um, and I think it can be really interesting to, to yeah, to, 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 to kind of put yourself in, in a position of being kind of bad at, at what you're doing, so to speak, and kind of make what you can from that position, I think is actually a much stronger position than being kind of good or kind of expert at something. And I'm not, I'm not like, I know, I, I realize I'm tying myself slightly in knots with my tongue because I'm not like, I totally am like, I, I do understand that there are experts in certain things and that it's really important that we listen to experts. But, um, but in, in writing and in art, I feel like every, I, I passionately feel like everybody is, and I, again, this is a kind of cliche in its own right, but everyone is an artist, everybody is a poet like in the sense that we all use language, we all have creativity and, um, and yeah, uh, that's, that, that's kind of fundamentally important. And it's all about how we all as individuals get access to that creativity and have kind of access to that expression. So for me, to answer the question, um, uh, it's, it is, it is, it is really hard to kind of, to kind of judge your own work or have a standpoint on your own work. And one of the reasons why I'm interested in uh, kind of intermedia work is it kind of, make puts you in that uncomfortable space mm. thank you so much colin yeah and that you. was super interesting and just to add quickly to that i also remember when i started to write i didn't think i was allowed to write like that was my main feeling like i'm this is not a territory i'm even allowed to like try on because you know i don't also have a formal training in writing so yeah mm. just to yeah. Um, I believe um, Winnie Tam um, has raised um, her hand earlier. Winnie, do you have a question or a comment? Okay, um, if not, I'm going to, um, to ask some of the questions left in the chat room. Matilda, do you have different feelings when you write in different languages? And when, when you are, when you're taking photography, um, do you have an idea in mind how these photos would match with um, language. 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to start with the last question. Um, no, when I take photos and when I write, these two things are very separate. And uh, the way I work is that I gather like a big, big pool of all kind of random things and then I edit them down afterwards. Uh, I think I have, uh, there is one or two exceptions in the book where I wrote a text specifically for a photograph. So that was sort of, when I was stuck, that was sort of maybe a, a method for me to, you know, look at a picture and then write about that picture. Uh, mm -hmm. But usually it's it's the, it's the not super connected when it's happening. Um, but right now I'm actually working on a, on a new project that is a self-portrait project again, uh, where I keep a writing journal or a shooting journal on the side. So I actually write and shoot and write and shoot. So that's sort of a new method I'm trying out. Yeah, and um, with writing in different languages, uh, no, because I also think that I think in different languages now. I think in Danish and I think in English. So it's not, it's, it seems pretty fluent in my brain. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question from um, Matilda. Um, what does the girl with calf eyes symbolize? <laughs> I, it's funny. I saw this question before, and I never thought about it myself. She just, I just remember that she had this like really big uh, brown eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean. She was a young girl, and a calf is a baby of a cow, isn't it? I guess. Or is the calf just the male version of a cow? I'm not even sure. Calf. Uh, baby. It's the baby. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. So then I guess my the symbolism kind of kind of makes sense that. Yeah, she was a she was just a young girl who just arrived, and I think it was her first um, trip as a model. And they just remember that she was so clueless, you know, and everybody was too lazy to do anything about it, mm. which was kind of heartbreaking. So I guess that was, yeah. We have a question for both um, of our speakers, uh, Colin and. Um, Matilda, how long does it usually take um, for you to to write um, beautiful works? Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm qualified for that question. Um, the uh, how long it takes to write? Um, oh, it just varies all the time. I I can uh, personally I write um, in a way that isn't. Uh, doesn't fit neatly onto a kind of a clock in the sense that um, I write constantly on my phone. So I, I take um, notes on my phone constantly to myself and then I kind of gather all that material and sort of sculpt it later into a poem. Um, and uh, so there's kind of two phases, I guess. One is like the data collection um, and then the other phase is the kind of like making it into some kind of shape. Um, so like that's why quite often, like I also, I quite often use the um, uh, kind of that same notes app for shopping lists and kind of other stuff that I'm kind of doing in my life. And so quite often that's why the poems have this kind of feeling of being quite every day as they sort of are like like they're kind of they're that I use the same space for keeping track of things in my everyday life as I do for um uh, uh putting in um uh like a, 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 the, the kind of material that I will then use for for poems and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the two um uh yeah I would say um Colin your work is um deceptively low-key Loki, um, I I used that word earlier as well, and um, and I think there's um, uh, just like um, Matilda's work, there's there's this surreal element of the everyday uh, in 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 your poetry, and especially when when you are um, reading the poems in such breathless way, and it really comes through. 
So, um, Richita. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I just wrote a note in my little book that says, and it was to Colin, I want your poem collections, but I, uh, uh, but can I have it with your voice? <laughs> so like you say, Tammy, it's like such a valuable thing to, uh, to hear your poems with like this very fast pace. Mm -hmm. uh, and my answer to the question is uh, totally the same. I write on my phone these weird small notes and I just laugh because I had then when I gather them I just gather them all in one document and I had one line that just said like white asparagus and I was like wait is this part of a poem or is it literally my shopping list <laughs> yeah so that was yeah I, I do it in very much the same way and then edit in the end mm. yeah we have um we have some more words of appreciation of our um, of our artists' writers' work. Um, and next question: Are all of your poems more or less autobiographical? How much does real life feed into um, your work? Does it make your life more interesting? Um, so suppose uh, does. Um, poeticizing your 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 work makes your life more interesting um i think we we covered some of this uh discussion but uh, if you have further comments that would be great um i could just quickly chip in and say um yeah in the sense that like i'm constantly writing kind of from my life so I'm I'm constant like I'm I, I I described the kind of way that I write just a second ago so there is like I guess a kind of autobiographical nature to that in the sense that yeah you're it's it's me that I'm writing and I'm, I'm not kind of or I often I, I often write in response to other things as well like so I like I, I write ecrastically a lot so it's more from like uh, in relation to artwork so it's more like about I don't think of it as being like a kind of autobiography in the sense that I'm creating a kind of stable, a kind of stable portrait of myself or that that would be possible. It's more like um, just about kind of encounters. So I guess it's like about the kind of, yeah, the, the meeting point or the kind of intersection between me and the world or something. And, and then the, and the, the poet, because poetry in a way is like, is um, I, I, I'm awful. I, I feel like I'm pretty bad today for making pronouncements about what poetry is but um but poetry for me is like a kind of yeah a kind of um uh, a way of experiencing the world like you know a, a way of like just being in the world and so um so yeah so there is an autobiography quality to it but it's not about creating a kind of uh, uh stable portrait i guess yeah so um yeah, that also resonates with me a lot. Uh, I, after my book came out, I have a lot of people say that it reminded them of like a diary. And I totally get that. It's very diaristic and a lot of it was written on my phone. So it has this like diaristic quality, but uh, also I just had to remind people sometimes that like these are texts that have been edited over like two years or something. So they are not just my diary notes, they are very also constructed. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, my whole, the whole book is a big performance and me performing in different roles and in different makeup and in different clothes. And so the text I think is also a reflection of that. And um, uh, then there was a question that was, that said, does it make your life more interesting? No, but it, I think uh, it makes my life sound more interesting. <laughs> That's probably, <laughs> yeah, what I would say. <laughs> um, okay, so um, another question um, from an audience member asking, how do you, um, what do you uh, consider? when you choose your collaborators. I think again, this we, we, we talked a little bit about that already. 
for Matilda, um, your collaborations with the um, three filmmakers. Um, perhaps Colin can can tell us more about the the projects because you have done a lot with um, with other writers and um, and artists. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, I, in terms of like how, I don't really, I don't feel like I'm choosing people. I don't, I don't think I've ever been in the sort of position where I'm the one doing the, doing the choosing necessarily, like, or I, in a way I have, but, um, but usually it just, they come about because I kind of, like I'm talking about ideas with people and we decide to do something and then we kind of start pulling it together and, and, and working on it. Either that or I've often been in kind of invited to do things rather than me doing the kind of invitation. Um, so, uh, but I do, I actually don't think, so I used to run a session here on collaboration and I actually don't think I'm a very good collaborator in the sense that, like I have done a lot of collaborations, but in the past, sometimes I've kind of, we've, we've worked on this collaboration together and then um, I've kind of wanted at the end of it, like my version of our collaboration and they can have their version of our collaboration. So the process has been very collaborative, but the kind of end result, I've kind of wanted a bit more control over it, um, which is, it's hard to resist. And I do, I do kind of try to resist that urge. Um, I also, even though I do absolutely love collaboration and for me, it's, I do think collaboration, like acknowledging the collaborative nature of, of kind of a lot of work is really important. Um, I also, think that um the collaboration itself isn't like a kind of positive value like sometimes it gets kind of knocked around and i probably do this you know that just saying work is kind of collaborative gives it like a kind of um positive value but actually like you have sometimes you do have to think about who you are collaborating with in terms of organizations that you're collaborating with or um institutions that you're collaborating with and whether you know like whether those collaborations are necessarily a great um kind of uh, have a great uh, kind of like associate the kind of associations that you want for your work and, and things like that which is i think important so collaboration itself isn't a positive value but for me it's a kind of just a feature of all work that all work is collaborative in some nature in the sense that if you have a book printed you know like you're working with designers editors etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's there is always a collaborative nature to work um, and it is important to to be to to kind of think about who you're collaborating with in your work for sure. Thank you. Um, next question um, is for um, Matilda, and I have to ask it because um, the uh, audience member says, um, "Hi, Matilda. I am just too shy um, to ask you." Um, I, I was too too shy to ask you a question, um, to ask you a question yesterday. So I plug up my courage to ask you now. I wonder why. Um, I wonder how. I wonder how teddy bear means to you, um, in the in in the work you mentioned yesterday. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, hmm. The teddy bear. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I mean, I'm raping a teddy bear, so obviously the the teddy bear is some kind of a victim. But uh, hmm. But yeah, but and also at the same time, it's the it's the path to my pleasure. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> The teddy bear is an innocent victim, I think, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. Well, um, perhaps we will have um, a last question. Um, I, I haven't read it myself. Um, both Colin and um, Matilda showed projects uh, where spaces were created for people to enter, to listen watch read and i have often said that a piece of writing in and of itself is a space matilda do you ever write on your body as a visual space colin 
I hear such a sense of uh, in inclusiveness as you discuss your work. Is there a principle of yours? And um, and another comment that um, that on the screen there is such a, a visual harmony in the light yellows and warm colors on the screen. So this is actually the, the second to last comment left on the... Um, I'm going to slightly disrupt proceedings by, um, by actually answering Matilda's question instead of my own, but uh, I will quickly answer my own. Yes, inclusiveness um, is definitely a principle of mine, like for sure, like open, like absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the question of uh, writing on your body, I've never, I've never exactly done that. Um, but I love the idea of it, and I would love. I don't have any tattoos, but I would kind of love to have a tattoo. Um, but I once wrote. I'll just. Very, this is very, very short. This poem, I promise. It's from this book called uh, Click and Collect, and it's, um, it's called Tat Design, Tattoo Design, Tat Design. My friends and I were at a shopping centre when this marine biologist spoke to me. I have an idea for a tattoo in which the shape of a humpback whale is drawn using only the letters of the words in the phrase, don't dream your life, live your dreams. I saw it on a poster in Iceland and thought, I just have to have that on my butt. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I've never used my body as a text, but I should start. Amazing, I love that. Um, yes, I have a... I have one text in my book that um, is just called My Capital, that is uh, explaining all the dimensions of my body because, you know, by now I know them by heart. I know in centimeters how, yeah. Uh, so I have one text, uh, you know, describing my body like that. But that's a pretty, I guess, bleak, bleak, uh, bleak way of looking at your body. Um, but uh, yeah, I have used it as a, a method sometimes, um, not actually with myself, but with, because um, I have these um, passport photos, the one that is of me on the cover, but I also have the passport photos of all the girls that I lived with. I asked uh, for their permission to um, print them. And these are like the photos uh, that um, are taken of you when you come to China and you have to have a, a residency permit. You have to do these photos with this amazing blue background. And um, I have sort of made it a writing exercise to look at these pictures and, um, you know, describe faces and yeah, uh, as like a starting point for other writing because I haven't really used it for anything, but. Um, yeah, I should probably do it on myself instead. That's probably a much better idea. I didn't notice your passport uh, photograph. Should yeah, and you are using it too also for the event. I love that, that I look like such a bitch and everyone else is like smiling and looking nice. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, um. I think our time is up um, and um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, thank you to our speakers, Colin and um, Motuda, and thank you to our International Writers Workshop team. We have one more uh, public event uh, this week on um, Thursday in the evening. Um, eight o'clock to half past eight, uh, half past nine. So we have a Glenn Diaz, um, fiction writer from the Philippines, and we have Colombian journalist um, Catalina Lobo Gorio, and they will be talking about the power of storytelling in nonfiction, and the discussion, the panel discussion, will be moderated by Dr. Jason Polly who is my colleague from the English department. Thank you so much again, um, Colin and um, Motuda.
Yes, thank you so much, Tammy and Colin. It was really wonderful. And thank you for all your questions also. And thank, thank you, you to, to, to our um, uh, audience members who, um, who are here with us. Um, we had, um, we had uh, about 80 uh, participants earlier and uh, there's a, a very great turnout and I'm very pleased. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you.